आई वी एम वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी अ डेली पॉडकास्ट बाय द तक्षशिला इंस्टीट्यूशन we are a bunch of policy nerds based in bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hello and welcome to all things policy i am suyash desai and i am joined by aditya parikh today's episode is an effort to connect some dots and put into perspective some information about design and construction choices of submarines during the cold war by the us and the ussr we would be exploring some cutting edge features technologies and tactics that have their origins in the cold war and the world war 2 era welcome aditya welcome to have uh, welcome on the show hi suresh it's a pleasure to be here and let me just acknowledge the super work that the us naval institute and non former have done for cold war era naval history and through reading their work uh, i'm in a position to today talk about uh, cold war era submarines and uh, the design and construction of uh, vessels that we see today yeah so aditya you are a submarine buff uh, where do you think submarine construction as we know today finds its roots well uh, the way these days ship building in general happens is in sections because you know there are huge uh, vessels that are uh, mounted on to a dry dock and then assembled so this process uh, originally comes from world war 2 nazi germany third reich uh, the grand admiral of the kriegsmarine uh, admiral karl donitz well uh, he noticed that uh, uh, the u boats were having an impact on the allies and their supply chains but they weren't able to uh, replenish their losses or even field uh, enough u boats to actually uh, you know strangle uh, allied efforts so he inquired why this was and the answer was that to, uh, the construction of the vessel just took far too long so uh his first instinct was to approach the uh, armaments minister of uh, uh, third reich albert speer he is more popularly known as uh, hitler's uh, architect however he was uh, the armaments minister during the war so uh, albert speer also agreed with him and he also sought a solution because he himself didn't have it so there was this curious individual called otto merker he was an engineer and an industrialist uh who was very famous for his uh, uh, mass production uh technology uh innovations so although he hadn't previously dealt with ship building in general but he had a very good idea of coming up with ways uh to fasten uh mass production of anything so his idea was just build separate parts separate sections and then uh assemble them onto a production line so this cut man hours uh, required significantly in construction of u boats and well uh, that's how we came to uh, this concept of uh, assembling sections of submarines and building them in as little as say 18 months 10 months so that became possible because uh, the germans had the ingenuity of coming up with the uh, production lines and uh, assembly lines oh that's very interesting i think Uh, so we often hear air independent propulsion would be a huge boost to any country's conventional submarines does this technology also have a connection to the past i'm glad you asked that suresh see uh, after the second world war the kriegsmarines uh, uh, type 21 were when you know when the dust was settled the type 21 was probably the uh, best submarine in the world to go to sea at that point so after the war uh, when germany had surrendered so uh, the allies especially the soviets uh, stalin had given orders to the red army that when you occupy you dismantle everything uh, and take it back to the soviet union for rebuilding so this included the industrial infrastructure of germany so uh, that also included the shipyards and uh, the submarines there and even the prototypes there so type 21 although uh, the design was mature enough to go to sea it wasn't exactly finished at the point but it had so many great ideas integrated into it including 
a form of air independent propulsion see aip uh, it's a technology that has a long history dating back to even before the second world war uh, the craig's marine had experimented with something called the uh, helmuth uh, walter hydrogen peroxide supplemented propulsion system so this was a very early form of aip uh, there was a lot of development but to post the second world war first uh, the supercars uh, in the shape of the western bloc and uh, the eastern bloc they uh, did pursue pursue it quite a bit but to, uh, they soon lost interest because nuclear submarines just gave them an edge and it was something that to, you know uh, the way the tide of history turned uh, it just made more sense than aip submarines so when uh, aip submarines became again important was uh, after the cold war had ended and uh, uh, sweden made its gotland class so uh, you know this this is something that to, uh, is quite often uh, portrayed to kind of belittle the absolutely humongous capacity that the us navy feels today so the, it was reported that one in one of the exercises this uh, swedish navy they uh, actually virtually sunk an uh, aircraft carrier of the us with their uh, aip enabled uh, sterling engine submarine uh, the scotland class so the swedes brought it back on the table uh, you know there's also this advantage that aip offers over nuclear propulsion in a very specific sense you know nuclear submarines since they have a, a reactor always uh, on board and they can't really shut it down otherwise it would take a lot of time to restart it uh, so they always have a coolant pump which makes noise and uh, this is a limitation when you're uh, laying on a seabed and trying to conceal yourself from the enemy uh, on the surface so diesel uh, electric submarines have this advantage that they can shut off just about almost all systems except their life support systems and uh, they almost become a black hole however nuclear submarines since they have to keep their coolant pump on well they lose that advantage so that's that's very interesting generally people have not viewed uh, generally people have not deep dived so much into this aspect of submarines aditya uh, i also often wonder why are submarines uh, in that iconic cigar shape i i presume you have some insight on that as well yes suresh uh, that shape is actually uh, called the teardrop hull shape so the idea behind that is because uh, when submarines dive they need a better hydronomic uh, shape compared to what you would have on a surface ship uh, it just cuts better through uh, the depths so early subs however going back to craig's marine going back to uh, just post war or world war 2 or just before that uh, you would find that they were quite shaped like corvettes this was because at that time they were semi uh, submerged corvette like vessels they also had air defense guns and all uh, which you would never find in modern submarines so the thing to understand is uh, when you actually look at early submarines they were actually teardrop hull shaped the cigar hull shaped however the germans had to regress because uh, you know those early submarines they were nothing more than uh, just uh torpedo boats and they were not exactly made for uh, operations submerged days on end so for days on end you need a very good propulsion system that can uh, just snorkel and charge batteries but that wasn't really uh, working with uh, world war era, world war 2 era subs uh, so the craig's marine had to regress to that shape uh, that's that's fascinating aditya uh also there are a lot of misconceptions about submarine basically because we don't understand the systems and technology that well uh, there is one uh, misconception that i would like you to focus on and clarify it for us are nuclear subs truly unlimited by range or do they have also have to surface or do they also have to come up what so what is this misconception can you address this please Yes, yeah, so I have all, uh, almost always noticed that everybody just uh, writes off uh, diesel electric submarines as being inferior in every sense. Like we previously just uh, talked about uh, that uh, noise making uh, problem with the coolant pumps on nuclear submarines is also uh, this fact that you know 
it's not even the fuel uh, that uh, that is in the long run going to last on a nuclear submarine. See, it depends very much on the reactor design and the level of enrichment that uh, the reactor is using. But anywhere between 5 to 25 years, you're going to see a, a nuclear refueling uh, on that platform. So it's not like you can just buy and build a nuclear submarine one and then you can forget about refueling it for uh, another 30, 40 years, whatever the end of life of the platform is. So it, uh, I mean, the French submarines, I, if I recall correctly, they have to be refueled every seven, uh, seven, eight years. So it's not really that, to, yeah, once you buy it, forget it. Uh, yeah, in a short, short term tactical sense that, yeah, when you're on a sortie, you're not thinking about refueling. You're just thinking about, uh, uh, reprovisioning, uh, the food, foodstuffs for, uh, the crew on board. But, uh, by operational range, yeah, they are, uh, they are virtually unlimited for a sortie, but it's going to come back into port and going to receive a lot of maintenance, probably far more and for far longer than a diesel electric would. It would have to have its uh, nuclear reactor shut or in some cases uh, with some uh, Soviet submarines, it was that you couldn't uh, shut off their reactors because if you did, they would just freeze. The coolant inside uh, used to freeze uh, at a normal room temperature and then it would be untenable. You would have to scrap the vessel. So there's a lot of uh, complexities involved that you would never find in diesel electric submarines. So nuclear submarines don't always have that edge and they're not truly unlimited in any sense, I would honestly say. But how much time does it take to refuel a nuclear submarine, uh, Aditya? Uh, I would say it takes months because, you know, they, ha- they have to uh, disassemble the uh, reactor block and then uh, they have to uh, actually refuel it. So it, it takes months. It's not a process where uh, you can just connect the fuel lines, clean the hull and uh, you're ready to go. It takes months. It's a disassembly and whole engineering process. It has to be recertified for operations and all that uh, trials and stuff happens. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Finally, uh, Aditya, the Soviet Union championed submarines for their fleet above all else. Are there any dots that we can connect there? I'm glad Suresh you uh, asked this because, you know, I'm fascinated by the fleet that the Soviet Union fielded back in the 70s. That was the peak of their uh, military buildup uh, during the Brezhnev era. And at that time, they were probably fielding the uh, biggest uh, nuclear submarine fleet in the world. And uh, I would say that uh, this was because of the asymmetric uh, nature of uh, uh, subsurface platforms. You know, uh, this has been a constant with the, this had been a constant with the Soviet system that they were always playing catch up with the Western allies in just about everything. Sputnik moment uh, excluded, they were always playing catch up in uh, technology. But you know, uh, the vision that to the uh, their chief of naval staff, uh, Admiral uh, Gorshkov, Sergei Gorshkov brought to the table, uh, he was always about to, uh, you know, high uh, high tech platforms first and asymmetric platforms first second first so uh, he was truly one of those people that challenged the us navy which at that point after defeating imperial japan had uh, come to this conclusion that yeah we can hold our own but he made them uh, rethink what they were doing and constantly strive for perfection so uh, going back to the soviet union uh, it also has a angle with Russia's maritime geography, you know, with perhaps one of the biggest areas of responsibility in their backyard being the Arctic, which is frozen over. So the Soviet Navy had to adopt to operating effectively in extremely low temperature conditions. Uh, I've heard anecdotes uh, by Indian naval officers uh, when when I've spoken to them that uh, Russian platforms in service with the Indian Navy, you have to have uh, temperatures inside the uh, ship uh, close to uh, 14 degrees centigrade at all times for the actual equipment to function because it has been made for those conditions back in Russian waters. So, uh, you know, these waters, if not patrolled constantly, the Arctic would give the Soviets adversaries a safe heaven uh, just off their coast where uh, these uh, adversarial powers could hide submarines that might threaten the Soviet Union's sea lines of communications and uh, the homeland itself with their uh, cruise missiles on board, 
there are ballistic missiles on board. So uh, there was also another problem that there was a capability gap uh, for the uh, Russians, for the Soviets uh, to reposition their fleet assets. So they were not just dealing with the Arctic, they were also dealing with the Atlantic and the Pacific. So they were aiming for a true blue water fleet. So, you know, with the Soviet Union, it was always about extremes. So whenever the uh, Americans challenged them with uh, better speeds, they tried to one-up them and they did. You know, when you read about the Alpha class, the Papa class, K-222 uh, 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 Ankar submarine, you know, uh, these two especially fascinate me. You look at their uh, propulsion system, like Bismuth cooled uh, reactors. You know, the uh, nuclear reactors were fueled by something, cooled by something that if you leave it not running, it's going to freeze over and uh, it's going to jam the system. And this actually did happen after the dissolution of the Soviet Union and uh, those alpha submarines had to be scrapped because uh, they were just turned off. And you couldn't do that with that design. It was, you know, pushing it to the extreme. 40 knots is something at which torpedoes are supposed to sail. Something that aircraft carriers are supposed to sail full steam ahead to escape a submarine. So when you're reaching that kind of speeds, no, it's something uh, that is unheard of. It is something actually extreme that I just don't even have words to express how uh, absolutely extreme that is. So uh, these submarines uh, also had something special, which is to this day, the Russians take pride in. They have this concept of double hulls and uh, they have this ballast hull and they have the actual hull of the submarine. So the ballast hull that they uh, built was supposed to be uh, made out of uh, titanium for these submarines, which is far harder to work with than uh, conventional steel is, which the most of the world made submarines out of. So the Russians always won up the industrial process that, yeah, we're going to push our naval assets to the extreme in that era. So I just absolutely love that. That's that's fascinating, Aditya. Uh, for people who are more interested in, in uh, knowing about submarines, I would ask you or I would request you to please check the latest blog, which is written by Aditya. Uh, it's on the Takshashila website. It's called Design and Construction of Submarine. Some cutting edge features, technology and tactics that have their origin in the Cold War and World War II era. Yeah, and Aditya writes a regular newsletter. Do you want to, in one line, can you mention what is your newsletter about Aditya? Sure, Suresh. Uh, my newsletter is called uh, Space Matters and uh, it looks at the geopolitics of space uh, as well as uh, the new launches, technologies and plans that are coming into fruition uh, for supremacy uh, in space by different space powers. Thanks, thanks, Aditya. Uh, we will uh, we'll make sure that both the links of the Aditya's blogs and Aditya's uh, newsletter are in the description of this podcast. Thank you, thank you guys for listening in uh, to this fascinating conversation on Submarine. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Suresh. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's been a really, really great week on the network. Let me make a couple of recommendations to you guys. Agla Station Adulthood, they have an extraordinary episode on relationships. Ritasha and Ayushi, as always, do a bang up job. I think you'll really enjoy that conversation. Check out Edges and Sledges, where DJ Ashwin and Varun have been talking to fans from different IPL teams on every episode. It's a really, really interesting project they've taken on during the course of the IPL. And as it comes to a conclusion, I'm sure you'll love to hear the thoughts on the tournament as a whole. 
I want to mention Uncle Police said they had a really great episode which dove into why is pollution so bad. And I think that given the circumstances we're dealing with right now, it makes a ton of sense to listen to that. Cyrus had a really great week on his show as well. On the Monday episode, he spoke to Raj and DK about all kinds of stuff. He was in one of their early movies. Definitely a fun conversation to check that out. And finally, let me talk to you about the Wire Talks with Siddharth Bhatia. We're very excited about this show. On the first episode, Jairam Ramesh is there having conversation with Siddharth Bhatia about the legacy of Indira Gandhi. I think you will really, really get something out of this. Do give it a listen. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. Entertainment is like food for the brain. It's a window to culture and a great way to understand the world around us. The internet has changed what it means to be an entertainer, creating new storytellers with millions of fans. It has spawned a new breed, the story sellers, those behind the scenes creating the business for this ecosystem. They work with brands, platforms and channels who are keen to capitalize on an audience hungrier than ever for more stories. I am Vineet Kanabar and I have a ringside view to how stories are told and sold. On my show, I bring you creators, artists, executives and marketers for a freewheeling conversation around the business of entertainment. Tune in to Storytellers and Storysellers for personal stories, analysis and criticism every Thursday as I talk to the brightest minds telling or selling great stories today.